Whether your beer is in a bottle, can, or glass, kick back and relax. It's Better on Draft. Welcome, everybody, to episode 323 of the Better on Draft podcast. My name is Ken. Thank you so much for joining us. I truly appreciate it on this Friday night. It is the end of July. We were off last week for the Summer Beer Festival over at Ypsilanti, Michigan. Go check out our write-up of that episode over on betterondraft.com. Let's go around the room and see what everybody is drinking, starting with Wendy. Wendy, what do you got to drink? Uh, I am drinking a Hefeweizen by my favorite homebrewer, 19 Normal. Um, and on tap, I also have a how much cheese is too much cheese, an orange key lime and banana cheesecake sour from Two Tides Brewing in Savannah. Daniel, what do you got? I don't even know what to say about that beer. It sounds like curdled <laughs> milk in your mouth. Um, I've got my own, um, and I made this is a barrel aged stout. God made it four years ago now. Um, haven't come up with a witty name for it like I did the other one. And then I've got a cookies and cream milkshake stout going on. Awesome. For myself, I have a beautiful Bell's Amber Ale, which I am going to be following that up with a beautiful Bell's Amber Ale. Uh, delightful that I re remembered I had two bottles in my uh, little mini fridge right behind me. Don't know how I lasted with two more bottles, uh, but there I am. We do have a guest host. Uh, as we are uh, looking for the next uh, top model of better on draft hosts. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, tell us, you know, about 20 second synopsis and tell us what you're drinking. Hi, my name's Jeff. I've done radio and audio production and podcast production. So a lot of time uh, behind the mic and then on the mixer. And I am drinking a peak Czech style Pilsner from Arvon Brewing in Grand Rapids and a Italian Pilsner from them on tap later. Perfect. I rave about outside ales over in Grand Haven has easily one of the best Italian pills I've had. I was actually talking to one of their sales reps today, and uh, he said that he tried so hard to get them to bottle it. And the owner said, no, thank you. Uh, so I will be looking for kegs probably for a, a little while until we get that. But we do have a guest uh, with us tonight. Uh, why don't you uh, introduce yourself? Tell us uh, who you are, what you do, and of course, what you're drinking. Oh, for sure. Thank you guys for having me on. I'm Jim McCune. I'm the co-founder of the Craft Beer Marketing Awards, better known as the CBMAs. Uh, tonight, I'm actually drinking a little bit of that zombie dust out of Indiana. Our friends over at Three Floyds Brewing. Um, they actually are one of the crushy winners as well, so... Love supporting everybody out there, and uh, Indiana's got a great craft beer scene. Well, let's talk about the crushies real quick. How did how did the CBMAs and the awards come together? Like, how did is this your brainchild? Did you work with someone? Um, how did it begin, and where did it start? I, I had the idea back uh, 2014, and uh, just waiting for the right time to be able to start a business. I have a full-time job in beer marketing and 2019 rolled around and we had all this incredible work that we wanted to submit uh, for an award ourselves. And to our surprise, there was no um, creative um, competition within craft beer. So uh, Jackie DeBella is my co-founder. The two of us looked at each other and, we cracked open a beer and I like, why don't we make it ourselves? So it took about a full year to develop um, the website and the judging platform and come up with the categories and get live. Um, and we were live for like maybe four weeks and we went right into COVID. Uh, <laughs> so it was a little bit scary uh, at that point, but didn't affect us at all. And CBMAs did so well its first year, uh, we decided to go global our second year. We had uh, Megan Wilson on from Harpoon Brewery, who is one of their marketing directors over there, and explained to us a lot of great things. And before I pass it off to some of the other guests to ask questions about the crushies and about uh, you, I want to ask you a more marketing forward question. 
where do you think brewers should spend their time marketing today as um, everyone is on thread? If you look at the top of our screen, we've got, you know, TikTok, Twitch, Facebook, Instagram threads on tapped. Uh, where do you think breweries should, you know, focus some of their time in 2023? You know, things get very expensive in marketing and especially when you're trying to support um your, your promotions with some sort of ad budget. So most brewers gravitate towards social media. It makes sense. Uh, it's controllable. It's highly targetable. So I think for most breweries, um, anything that's digital social media, that's pretty much at the top of uh, their chart. But what we've been seeing is people who have been dabbling in PR have been getting a really a lot of engagement. So, I would say try to do a press release. Um, if you have a, a new beer coming out, maybe beyond just posting that on social media, um, sending out a, a press release on the wire. It, people think it's costly, but you know, even if it was eight hundred or a thousand dollars, the amount of journalism that um, comes your way from that, it really makes um, an incredible value. So I'd go with PR. Do you find any value in social media right now for a lot of these businesses? Or do you think it's kind of a, a younger person's market? No, I mean, you know, my mom's 75. She's on Facebook all the time. You know, we're all on TikTok. Like the world has become an incredibly digital place. So I do think, I think they say more than half the world is on social media now. So it, it does make sense that that's the number one tactic. Well, uh, before I pass it off to Wendy, how did the live uh, crushies go this year at the Craft Brewers Conference? It was the first time you actually, you know, did it live in front of people. How did it go? It it, it had a couple little hiccups, but overall it went really smooth. Everyone that was in attendance had, had a blast. Uh, we were really fortunate this year. Um, we, we had a category where we went into um, raise money for a charity. And um, Post Malone had donated like uh, 250 of his brand new games. So everyone in the audience got to, to leave with the game. And uh, that was a lot of fun. And we live streamed it to the world and, it, you know, it got thousands of views. So for the first true one at live, I'd say we did pretty good. Uh, speaking of that category where you uh, raised some money, uh, I was going to ask about that because obviously as somebody who has some beer tattoos of her own, um, it caught my eye. <laughs> so could you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, uh, we were raising money for um, scholarships and we ended up raising $3,500 and um, Athletic Brewing Company ended up matching it. So we ended up raising um, $7,000. And that was for the for the scholarship funds, right? The MJF scholarship fund? Sorry, you broke up there a little bit. Yes. That's awesome. Are you guys going to do something like that again next year? Yeah, we definitely want to like double down and... Um, try to figure out new ways to raise uh, even more money this year, but it's an incredibly uh, valuable co cause and uh, we're definitely looking forward to that again. Jim, you guys have a, quite a few judges uh, that participate in this process. What kind of instructions do you give the judges? What kind of criteria are they using to make their decisions and what, what would you advise uh, people submitting to do to stand out in front of the judges as far as their entries go? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, we've been really fortunate um, in our four years of competition to have an incredibly large uh, judges panel. I think this year we had over 650 from around the world. Some of them are celebrities in our industry and um, they will volunteer their time. So they have a pretty rigid set of um, questions that are asked of them uh, for each entry that they visually critique. And they have a numeric drop-down system in which they answer those questions and uh, each 
entry basically gets a ranking number and the top ranked uh, work wins. And what, what would help, what would be a good advice to help somebody stand out to the judges? Do you have any advice for people entering for the next cycle? Yeah. I mean, it's really one of the most incredible parts of uh, creating the crushies and seeing it evolve um, is just the innovative work that is being submitted. So I, I think what we're seeing now is the desire from the consumer to really be able to look at a package quickly um, and discern like the data that they want to understand, like what style is it, what's the ABV, you know, who brewed it. So uh, packaging really got wild there for a couple of years. And I think what you'll start to see is more shelf sets and breweries who really didn't have the opportunity when they started out start making an IPA, they start making a sour, taking a holistic uh, look at the entire brand and then sort of um, creating a brand identity um, holistically. For awesome. Thanks, Dan. I believe Wendy still had some questions oh, there. All right. Oh, <laughs> that's all right. Um, I thought you were going to jump in, actually, Dan. So, um I do have a couple of questions though. Do we have any new categories coming up for the 2024 crushies? Yeah, we actually have an exciting one where we're going to have like a mini competition within the competition. Um, I don't have uh, all the details now, but we are going to open up a category um, for a design created specifically for this category that will be uh, presented in a very cool way uh, the Craft Brewers Conference, which is happening in Vegas um, in uh, end of May or beginning of April. And uh, what is this award cycle? When do they, when do you have to get your entries in? Uh, we open typically September 1st and we run an early bird special. So uh, that usually goes to like Halloween ish. Then, um, Entries are usually open till about March 14th. At that point, uh, we close down um, the portal and then the judges can actually start to do their judging. And that usually happens um, April into May. And we have our results typically like just days before the Craft Brewers Conference. And before I pass it over to Dan, um, what is the most or least competitive of the categories? um least competitive meaning um maybe the easiest to win sure well that actually is just something that happens naturally when we create a new category um our sort of legacy categories that have been there since day one have really built up um equity over the years and um i would think it's probably obvious that 16 ounce can design like is our biggest category. But uh, sometimes when we roll out a new category, um, it takes a little time to get some traction. So I would say if uh, you look at to sort of pad your chances a little bit, look out for new categories because it takes a little time for them to become really competitive. That makes sense. All right, so taking a look here, um, when I first look at your trophies, I have a terrible mind. So my mind immediately went somewhere else. Why don't you uh, tell us the story <laughs> in the background behind these trophies and how you came up with them? Yeah, definitely. And uh, I would say I you should see my inbox with some of the comments. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, that's our Crushy Award. Um, it's a heavily tattooed arm crushing a can and represents like all the men and women in the industry who are doing, you know, great things um throughout the process but like i was always saying our my partner and i would go to hundreds of these craft beer tasting events over the years and we were just wondering like when are they going to celebrate the other side the people who design the packaging and make the merchandise and, and sell the beer now taking a look at some of your categories i see you have it broken down into, into different regions of the world here how did you start getting these breweries from other regions, such as uh, South Pacific? Um, I see you have an Asian 
um, category, you have Africa. How did you get these breweries involved with this, especially so fast? Uh, you know, like I think there was a need for the Craft Beer Marketing Award. So it was one of those things that we kind of just opened up and it took off. We were also really fortunate. Like if you go to thecrushies.com and you click on our news category, we just completed our fourth competition. And it, it that list is almost endless. You, you can hardly even scroll to the bottom and that is so many people from Forbes to every single industry magazine and paper writing about us because I think it's fun. It, we're really just this non-intimidating entity where people can enter um, their best work, get incredible value by our judges critiquing that work. And every entry, every entrant or winner at any time can request the judges critiques. And they can use that to help ladder up or, you know, learn, learn things they might not have known. So I love that part. And the other part, Dan, just to let you know, is every one of our winners goes on a year long media tour. So we have a whole PR team that take that winner's list and they go after local media. So oh wow! when you check out that list, you'll see how many breweries are on their local news or had a, a story about the artist or all the wonderful things breweries really do for charity and, and beyond. I'm actually glad you said that. My next question was going to be about, be about the bigger than beer cause related beer project or campaign. Um, tell us about some of the entries you've had for that over the last couple of years. It's amazing. Like I would say, go to the crushies.com and check out our winners galleries over the last four years. Like I get choked up at the award ceremony. I, I was like fighting back tears because that category is like super special. If you go through and see what breweries are doing, I mean, there's a brewery in Mexico. They all they do is raise teddy bears for kids in hospitals. It's like amazing things. There's breweries saving the reef. There's breweries trying to make the world better, make us better, strive to be better. And, you know, our industry had some tough times over the last couple of years where we we suffered a lot of the things that happened in other industries that never happened in craft beer. And I think the people in it rose to the occasion and we all want to do better and be better. And I love that part about the industry. And, and that's why I'm in craft beer. And one final question here before I pass it over to Jeff. Um, going into the best can design or best bottle design, what, what's the most ridiculous bottle or can you've had come across so far you know there's one that was pretty crazy um from duclaw brewing it was called give a crap ipa and it just kind of dovetails perfectly into your last question that was for like colon cancer awareness and it was give a crap was normalized sitting down with your friends and talking about you know have they got their exam like <laughs> Um, you know, cancer is a terrible, terrible threat. And I think people who went early intervention and they partnered with the Colon Cancer Society of America and and Squatty Potty. So uh, if you check out our last podcast, we actually had all, all those folks on. And it just shows a silly thing um, can turn into something that really saves someone's life. Yeah, absolutely. Jeff, I'm going to pass it over to you. Thanks. Uh, I do like the philanthropic angle that you've talked about today and, and, I, and what I've heard you talk about in other podcasts uh, as the stepdad of a cancer survivor. Uh, that definitely comes home for me. Uh, and I did think that collaboration with Squatty Potty was really interesting. So I was curious, have you seen any other cross- industry collaborations that you thought were really innovative or, or interesting and what's one that you might want to see that you haven't see yet seen yet? Ooh, that's a good question. I mean, there is so many worthy causes out there and with 15,000 active breweries in the country, I really think if we normalize breweries um, doing that with, you know, multiple brands throughout the year, uh, we could see incredible things. Um, uh, you just had that winner's gallery up. And I think if you go through those, those are just the winners. Like not everybody could win, but in my mind, like 
if you saw all the entries, I mean, they're all winners. So, I mean, maybe that's not even something that we could do where they all somehow get visibility because it, in every little tiny way, every single one of them is helping the world be better. Dan touched on the, the winner's gallery that's on the Crushies website, and and you just mentioned it. We were just showing it off. Uh, one of the – you can – somebody – anybody that goes to that website should block out some time and just – scroll through all of the images there because it's a really great section of your website. But uh, one thing that stood out to me was the tap room and beer garden experience. Uh, for me, beer is as much a social or cultural phenomenon as it is about the taste or or the style of beers that I'm drinking. And I, I thought it was interesting that, you know, you have this award for the tap room and beer garden experience, but how do your judges evaluate that? Do they actually go to these spaces or do they, uh, how do those submissions get evaluated? It's a great question. Um, we wanted to make sure that we accommodated video so the judges can be um, supplied with a walkthrough of the of the space. And if not, then it's done through like a montage of photos that they upload. But uh, each brewery writes a description of you know what makes their place special. Uh, I, I always try to reinforce every entrant. These are all human beings. Like, you know, they all like different things. They all react to different things. So when you enter, make sure that you're really explaining um, your your entry to the fullest um, intent of everything that you created because you never know what string you might pull on a judge. And I always say it's any given Sunday and um, it's wild what wins. Going back to your participation in craft beer, I'm, I, I'd like to know a little bit more about your backstory and how you became a participant in the craft beer industry. I, I feel like most of us have gateway beers into craft beer, like the, the one beer that took us off of the mainstream and into craft beer. You've worn many hats in your uh, professional career. I think I heard you say you, you did uh, marketing in Hollywood at one point. So how did you go into craft beer? What was your gateway into that world? It, yeah, I did. I was in marketing for um, sports and sports entertainment and, you know, worked with pretty much every famous company that you could ever think of. And uh, I love that job. But two of my buddies had opened up the Blue Point Brewing Company in Patchogue, New York. And uh, I was just graduating college at the time. And they were like, could you do our logo? And I was like, yeah, sure. So I was on on the side for like 17 years of that other job doing all of their work. And all of a sudden they become like the 32nd largest brewery in the country. Um, and I, I'd be showing people my work, you know, with UFC and WWE and they were like, what you did this brewery logo. So at that point, that was 10 years ago, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I saw the writing on the wall and I, I, I jumped into craft beer full time and I knew I could offer those type of marketing services and strategic thinking and really realized over those 17 years, how much I did learn, um, which a lot of it was really proprietary because when they opened in 1997, there was only 400 breweries in the whole country. So, uh, but to answer your other question, I am a hippie. I used to travel with the Grateful Dead. <laughs> um, I grew up on Heineken and Grolsch and, and German beer. But someone handed me a Sierra Nevada um, pale ale in that little green bottle. And when I had that, that was probably the first time I really had delicious hops. And I have been on the chase ever since then for more hops. Nice. I'm, I'm on that same journey. <laughs> One more question before I hand it off. Uh, you seem to be at the cutting edge of where things are in craft beer marketing. Where do you see room for innovation in the in the industry? Uh, you know, the crazy thing that is happening all around us, and some of us are embracing it more than others, but at some point we're all going to have to just accept that AI is here. Um, and the things that I'm seeing people do, not just web developers, but everyday people, who are innovative and smart and have an idea are using these new, mostly free AI tools to create uh, 
incredible new new thing. So I do I do look forward to seeing how craft beer embraces that uh, and all the incredible things that could come from it, whether it be new recipes or new artwork or who knows, it could be a new category. Now I'm thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm excited, but I'm also I'm also a little wary. Wendy. So I have a few questions about the marketing side. Um, when I saw you in a podcast with the craft beer professionals, um, a conversation about standout brewery marketing strategies, um, where you said that merchant is basically like a walking billboard. And I am the type of person who 90% of my outfits um, include some type of brewery t-shirt or craft beer group shirt. And I know that a lot of people talk, ask me about whatever shirt I'm wearing. So that I get the chance to talk about the breweries on a regular basis. So I'm actually living proof of what, <laughs> what you said. My question is, what type of merch do you suggest for a small brewery that doesn't have a big budget for a store yet? That's a great question. Um, I'll do a shout out. Uh, I've been using brewery branding. If you check them out, they're specific to the industry and they work with breweries, you know, who small to large. So they have uh, various different ways um, uh, to make all of the things they offer accessible. This is a great one for everybody. I mean, we call them slaps out here, stickers. Uh, this is one Crushies just did, holographic paper. This is like the most holographic paper I've ever seen in my life. And these guys made them and uh, everybody wants these. Like, I don't know if it's as popular where you guys are, but like everybody puts these on their water bottles. So like stickers, uh, these are probably, you know, under a dollar and just imagine the value of that. Um, someone walking around with that all day or, you know, stuck in a, in a popular spot. And now with QR codes, like that's another little quick addition. Uh, all of our stickers have QR codes on the back. Um, and that always gets that extra click through. So all of a sudden, you know, maybe you're getting 30,000 likes and you got these stickers out there and you can't believe next year you look at your analytics and it's 100,000, you know, uh, visits. So those are the types of little things you could do to always be growing your traffic and your engagement. I'm going to, I'm going to hop in real quick. Sorry, Wendy. Um, okay. One as uh, myself and Wendy have both poured, uh, donated our time to these breweries uh, at these events, these festivals, because uh, they need assistance. Oh. They need help. You know, breweries in the UP can't come down, you know, bring their full force of team uh, to do pouring for the entire time. So we'll help out where we can. Uh, and everybody just asks for stickers. Uh, but you said QR codes. And I remember in 2019, um, a, a certain brewery uh, that's on North Center Road, just south of 8 Mile. They are our sponsor, which is why I uh, give them a little shout out here. Uh, North Center <laughs> Brewing uh, said that QR codes are dead. Now, I want you to think, well, we're going to pretend that COVID didn't happen. Are QR codes dead or do you think the rebirth of QR codes that we kind of got from COVID would have happened just a different way? I would say they weren't wrong in saying it was dead. That those those things were dead for a bit. I wanted them to die. I I I think they're weird, but I never really thought about how incredibly powerful they are. So I think when they first came out, they were head of, head of the time. And then everyone did what they did. They were trying to make their own QR codes. I think Microsoft had a little tiny one and the good old fashioned, you know, one by one QR code is back. And when you can go and create a free one in seconds, um, it's just a great tool that everyone knows how to use. And I'll tell you one thing that was the major advance of it and what really resurrected it was all the phones building QR code readers into the cameras. Back in the day when you have to download the QR app and then open the app and then try to get it to focus on it. Now, I mean, you just glance the phone at it and it, it could catch it at any direction. So I do think they're here to stay. So I kind of agree with that too, even though I 
to have a love hate relationship with them. Um, I want to go back a little bit to the merch. I, I always called it swag cause I'm old, but, um, one of my biggest issues, and I'm sure I've talked about this on the show before is I I'm a bigger girl. And when I go into a brewery and I can't buy a shirt because I want to talk to you about it, I want to talk to people about it. It drives me insane. Yeah. What is your opinion of, or do you have a, maybe a company or a brand that you suggest to people that is more inclusive in size? It drives me insane that breweries keep buying shirts for kids when they're not old enough to drink their product. <laughs> I couldn't agree with you more. I really don't think there should be anything above adult sizes uh, for anything in beer. I mean, I guess the dog leashes are fine and dog collars and dog bowls. But, you know, when it comes to the kids, it goes too far. Um, but, yeah, like when we order our merchandise, we make sure that we have everything or nothing. Like there's no reason we wouldn't want um, everyone to be included. Um, one thing that we do roll out for certain breweries, and it makes a lot of sense. I've been doing it almost since the beginning. You know, that's a long time. But is print on demand. So instead of like trying to keep up with the chase of like, oh, we need 50 large and 50 small, like just put all your designs on these print on demand sites. The shirts are maybe three bucks, five bucks more. I don't think consumers are, are getting crazy over that small amount to have not only the flexibility to get whatever they want, but the incredibly wide variety of stuff you could get it printed on beyond shirts, hats. So I love that flexibility, but it's a great question. And, and it, I think every brewery should strive um, harder to, to be able to include everybody. So great question. Maybe that their medium shirts aren't actually extra small. No, nah, the mediums are always like <laughs> extra small. Like, believe yeah, me, I fit it on my arm and I'm like, what is this? If your medium doesn't fit an 11 year old, then you're probably not <laughs> buying the right brand. Yeah. That um, that actually should be even surfaced at a higher level. So it is an excellent question. So are there any trends that you see right now that are on the horizon that haven't really hit the masses yet? I think there's a lot of crazy things that start coming down the pike. I, I, you know, one thing I've been keeping my eye on is new technology that's going to print directly on cans. Um, I, I think one of the biggest businesses uh, within craft is the label business um and, and it's it's an awesome one so i think innovation in that space will be cool um i if you've ever had the opportunity to come out to the craft brewers conference uh they had thousands and thousands of vendors it's basically like disneyland for for craft brewers and the technology um in fermenting and ingredients uh, is, is incredible um if you check out um, Yakima Chief hops, like new varieties of hops, you know, different levels of oil, aroma. Like I heard somebody say like beer did everything beer can do. And I was like, what? Beer's just scratching the surface. Like the things that have been happening over the last couple of years, as far as new styles, like did any of us expect hazy IPAs? <laughs> <laughs> When I was younger, if you saw a beer this color, you'd pour it down the drain. Now, the more it looks like orange juice, the more we want it. So lots of different things, I think, to still um, to expect. And my last question before I pass it back to Ken is, is there something you've seen that a brewery, tr a brewery try that just really didn't work for them? Hmm. You don't have to name names. Yeah, you don't have to name names, but it can be very general. Huh. That one caught me off guard. Um oof. Yeah, I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't know if I have one on that. But yeah, I'm sure there's many. I probably suppressed them because <laughs> I'm I'm in the business, but yeah. Sorry, Wendy. That's all right, Ken. Yeah, for sure. So we actually have uh, someone who is a um, I uh, someone actually I reach out to when I have issues regarding marketing. Uh, Dave over at I think he's at Batch. 
um, wanted a question. He said, is there a category for the CBMAs uh, for event theme and or execution? Great question. And that is going to be one of our new categories. Uh, we, we got a lot of inquiries about uh, brewery events and um, we, we have brewery event space, but not the events themselves. Uh, we had groups, but that will definitely be a new category in 2024. You heard it here on Better on Draft. <laughs> Love it. Uh, before we get into our final questions for the night and kind of wrap up, uh, I do have a few more questions that I want to ask. Um, the first one, obviously, as you mentioned, new category for 2024, first shared on better on draft. Uh, what goes into determining the categories, uh, that you create for the awards? It's actually one of our biggest challenges because, you know, we always say we want to run the gamut of you know, everything in marketing, in beer, but it's not really feasible. Um, you mentioned before about, you know, entries. We had a couple duds along the way. We, we thought like brewery sales sheets, you know, would have been a thing and it really never took off. So that was one that was actually removed from the list. Um, so it, it's an evolution, I would say. Uh, the great part about Jackie and I, this is our side hustle, like, we are all ears. Like we only want this to be better for the people who participate in it. So we um, listen to everybody and we have a rule that if you tell us something and we implement it, we send you a free entry and uh, we send out who knows, probably a hundred of them a year because we take so much advice and we need it. <laughs> Well, speaking about Jackie, you've brought her up a few times. Uh, what can someone expect when listening to some of your older episodes of your podcast, Marketing on Tap? Well, we just got ranked the number 67th uh, top rated marketing podcast in Croatia. So we are <laughs> growing. Uh, <laughs> they're great. Like the, they, It's definitely for an inside crowd. Um, it's, it's for our participants. It's for brewers. Uh, primarily if you, if you scroll back, they're past winners, past judges. Um, but we really get into the nitty gritty of marketing for beer. And, um, there along the way, there's some incredible insights that you really couldn't get unless you talk to someone who worked there. So that part I'm really proud of, and we'll be back for a new season. Uh, definitely, uh, an abridged version, um, with some new tricks, you know, for your, your next season, I might have a uh, struggling podcast voted number, you know, top three beer related podcast by our mothers, uh, the better on draft Hold podcast. Up. We, we were named, we were named one of the top uh, beer podcasts by hop culture last year. So, Oh yeah. I, I mean, I was, I was just trying to, you know, tag along with the, the number 67 <laughs> in Croatia. Uh, you know, that would be very narcissistic of you, Dan, to mention something like that. We don't do Sorry, that. My here. bad. My but you bad. know, that's a podcast was another one that was sort of like people were raising their hand. Like we have this incredible podcast. It's dedicated to the craft beer industry. Like, why don't you have that category? Why don't we? Boom. We added it free entry. And that's actually one of our favorite categories. We get so many compliments from the judges you know, we didn't know about this one. Wow, I really never dove down into the back episodes. And it, every podcast is educating and affecting and influencing someone. So every building brick that we all do um, could never be discounted, even though I poke fun at it sometimes. Well, at ourselves. As we are live, we obviously do get live comments, and we do have one more question from the uh, Face or Twitch group. Uh, this is from Muttbone. He says, the CBMA's 2023 judge panel is pretty extensive. How do you go about maintaining this list of people and keeping them engaged throughout the judging process? As crazy as it might sound, you know, we were at almost 800 judges there was a pretty big um, layoff, um, if you guys recall, a few months back. And uh, I woke up one day and lost 85 judges in, in one day. So that judge was built by me. Uh, every judge was vetted. 
they're all in the creative or uh, beer or beverage space. Um, and we do research to make sure like that one that they want to do it because it's volunteer. It's to ask anyone in this day and age to do anything for free, no less sort of help us out all season, promote it on their networks and then volunteer hours of their time. Um, they do it for the love of it. And we are a pretty fun group. I'll admit that we, we do cool stuff. We're always talking and, uh, we're always willing to uh, do anything anyone needs when it comes to help. And, and that is another proud part of what we built here is the network. Like, and, you know, if you called me, Ken, and were like, you know, we would love to have these guys on as a guest. I will get you guys connected. Like, we have become this incredible hub uh, for people to connect. I've had breweries call me and say, we saw those guys win. You know, they're in Mexico. I can't get in touch with them. Here you go. Those guys now have an incredible collaboration, a Chicago brewery and a Mexico brewery, like making this new beer. Like we had a little piece of that. And that is all the cool stuff I love. Before we get into the final questions, uh, we're going to be digging up a little bit of your past, Jim. Oh uh, we found an article that you wrote uh, for craft brewing business back in 2021. And you did a prediction for 2022. And as we sit here in 2023, I would like to see how you feel about the predictions that you made. So I don't okay. know if you remember uh, what you wrote. This might be a new surprise to you. Um, oh, but you wrote for 2022, the year of the brand refresh. The pandemic yes. forced breweries to pivot or perish. Yes. Do you think that you were correct? And what do you think happened over the last two years to uh, agree or disagree with your sentiment? Oh, yeah, that one was dead on. I mean, look at how many breweries have rebranded re in the last like two and a half years. Like even traditional brands like Anchor and uh, the, the, the list of them goes on and on. So uh, even in our own space, we've seen a tremendous amount of breweries uh, refreshing. So uh, I definitely think what happened during COVID was that downtime allowed people to look at their brand and sort of go back to what I had said earlier, instead of like these disparate um, brands that they created one after another is to refresh the entire brand holistically um, and so many breweries. Uh, I know Captain Lawrence Brewing just did one. Uh, Funky Buddha did one. Um, yeah. Well, the, the second one, which I think uh, a lot of people are here to agree with, that contactless technology is here to stay. Um, I know a lot of people do not like the... Uh, the world of QR codes using their phone. They want to interact with someone or they want to see a physical menu. Um, do you think we're going to shy away from it? Or do you think we've reached the, the precipice and this is where we are for contactless technology? Yeah, it's definitely one of those things that's um, infused directly into the business now. Um, the, it's apparent, you know, when you go to the craft brewers conference and, or any of the local shows and see, you know how how many offerings there are in this space um we got the opportunity to work with arrived a r y v e d and um they have an incredibly uh diverse point of sale um offering that if you look at the data the proof is there people are tipping more people are ordering more people are ordering faster much less complaints so if we learned one thing from COVID is uh, customer service um, came right back to the top as being number one in tap rooms or really any business now, but also what we call frictionless where get me in and out of there, like waiting online, you know, 10 deep to get a beer. We don't want that anymore. Let me scan a QR code and pick it up over here. Like we'll see more and more of that, which I'm happy about. 
I I think one thing that uh, agrees with your sentiment that I love is the local, the corner brewery, Arbor Brewing here in Ypsilanti, Michigan. Uh, You can go in, you sit down, you order, you don't even talk to a bartender or a server at that time, Uh, but they're still around. They're still asking if you have any questions, if they see someone order, but um, it helps one turn tables. Uh, for those in the industry, get people in, get people out. Uh, but two, uh, especially on a really, really busy night, you're able to, you don't have to flag down and, you know, feel like the weird guy that you're waving. Like, hey, come over here. I need help because, you know, they're drowning because someone called off. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree with you. But the last one, direct to consumer is here to stay. Um, I I am going to tell you that I disagree with this sentiment only because it is impossible to get legal um, changes in the U S consistent across the country fast. Um, I want to say direct to consumer will exist. A lot of these band-aids like in the state of Michigan, direct to consumer um, there's a little bit more leeway and to go. I just don't think we're going to get the, the want that beer fans and alcohol fans want do you agree disagree what do you think yeah, yeah i think i think in hindsight i might have been a little overzealous there or wishful maybe um i, I think here in new york we're really fortunate that way I, I could have anything delivered to my house you know cannabis now like um but yeah i it's one thing i probably didn't consider as much it was the state by state um variations on laws and I see some areas where three tier seems to be like blurry nowadays. So it's definitely something I actually want to revisit. And, uh, but yeah, I'll agree with you that this one I'm not sure on anymore. Well, I'm glad I still have a pulse within the industry for the uh, the amount of time I spend talking about it here on Friday nights. That's for sure. Uh, Jim, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I truly appreciate it. As we end every single show, we ask one final question, something fun, lighthearted, because obviously while marketing uh, might be entertaining to some, might not be entertaining to others. Obviously, uh, the beer industry is an up and down industry, but it's meant to be fun meant to be shared over a beer. Uh, So we're going to start with Wendy. Wendy, what is your final question here for Jim? Uh, Is there a, an entry that came across in the awards that you were so impressed by you had to go find them? Yeah. You know, if you could look up Studley Brewing Company, they're in uh, Chesapeake, Virginia. They have a baseball themed brewery. And when I tell you they spared no expense making sure everything was baseball, um, we got a first glimpse when they won a Crushy Award for their beer flight, which is this adorable little um, four um, sampler, looks like a, a baseball base. And the spinner is a baseball bat. Like, But then when you actually look, I think they won this year for uh, Coolest Brewery and see the murals and um, just all the theme work that they put into it. That I love in any business where um, the owner's passion for something um, is so great that they decide that they're going to completely infuse it into their business. So that's one example. Uh, There's so many of them, but that one always stands out to me as something very special. That's awesome. Jeff, your final question. All right, Jim, you're the king of craft beer, at least for a day. And with your powers, you can abolish either one style of beer or one trend in beer. What are you wiping out? Oof. Oof. I don't know. Like My instinct would say sour, but I know I would hurt so many people, so I could (laughs) not do that. I think no matter your choice, you might hurt someone. Yeah, that's that's kind of a loaded question, isn't it? Oh, uh, I love hoppy beers. I mean, the more hops, the better. Um, I would say anyone who's making hazy beers not the right way, that should stop. And I know um, not a lot of people are too aware of it, but there are certain breweries that are adding adjuncts, maybe even orange juice, I heard. I don't know if that's an urban legend, but... 
Um, I think brewers, because it's part science and part art, really just trying to figure out the proper ways of doing it. And uh, there's so many great beers out there to strive towards. I've had some sad, hazy beers. That is <laughs> yeah. Dan, what's your final question? So just to touch on that last one real quick, according to former host John Kimmich, you know, the inventor of the New England IPA, that'd be about 99% of those beers out there. Um, my final question here for you is you mentioned working with the WWE. There are a lot of current and former hosts that are pretty big fans. Tell us what you did for them. Uh, WWE is my longest client in my entire career. I, I worked with them for 12 years straight in marketing. Uh, we primarily uh, promoted pay-per-view. But, uh, yeah, I got to go to every pay-per-view event for 12 years and travel the world and um, got to meet every wrestler, like, not just meet them, but, you know, really became friends with a lot of them. Uh, pretty amazing days. Well, with Nick out, I think this is the the best uh, question to ask to finish the night. Um, Jim, uh, what is in your fridge right now? What are you going to be drinking after the show? It's only eight times. That, that isn't craft beer. What's your guilty? It could be. Oh, it. you know, I've been like exclusively beer for so long. Um, I never really was like a cocktail guy. What I did recently, about a year ago, uh, was forced to try a Moscow Mule. And man, did that change my entire world. I, I became a Moscow Mule person. And uh, I went on a journey to find, you know, the most ginger beer. So uh, along all my incredible New York beers, I try to drink local as much as I can. Uh, but I do like to still go back to, you know, some of my roots, like a zombie dust. That was one of my first craft beers back in the day. Uh, but if it's not beer, it's going to be a margarita. Do we lose you, Ken? There we go. Let's try that again. Craft <laughs> Beer Marketing Awards. Uh, Jim McEwen, thank you so much for joining us. Where can people find you? Um, one more time, when does 2024 uh, entries begin? Uh, give us the rundown before we let you go. Definitely check us out at thecrushies.com. We are trying to open by September 1. There is a chance we might not open till October 1 this year. Um, but if you check out the website, um, you could give us your email address at the bottom and stay in touch with us. If not, check out the website. There's so much great content there in our news, in our podcast, um, and check out our judges. We have some pretty famous people. I think you guys met Zane, uh, you know, incredible figure in the industry. He's been a big help. But, uh, yeah, we really appreciate everybody's support and uh, just love this industry. Uh, the last time we had Zane on in the middle of the show, he left the show to go get his crushy to show it off. Excellent. Uh, so he definitely uh, enjoys it. Uh, yes, there's there's one right in this front. Is, I think you guys might have known the first one was created by the same people who make the Emmy Award. Um, we thought it would be really cool this year to reinvent the crushy. So it's now a tap handle. So when oh. you win the award, you can display it. Um, it's, it's done really beautiful by uh, Steel City Taps down in Alabama. So we were able to bring our Crushy Awards. They're all produced, made in America. Um, and we have a brand new shop. You could also check out at the website. That's awesome. All right. That is going to do it for this episode, episode number 323. For everyone, find us on social media. That's uh, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, Untapped, YouTube, Kick uh twitch twitter threads or x whatever rumble. it's called the rumble <laughs> yes everywhere that you can find social media you can find us at better on draft and no matter what you think of your beer we think it's better on draft have a good night Cheers. nice meeting you guys thank you